Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg, and I'm a research study coordinator here at the Havey Institute. I will be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy, joining us all the way from Paris, France. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. Thank you for joining us. Bonjour, I say. Here we are in France, but uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Katie, for helping put this together. Absolutely. Our viewers will know that Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. Who answers your COVID questions and public health or infectious disease questions each week on the Havey Institute's Global Facebook page, Global Health Facebook page, excuse me. Today, Dr. Murphy will be reacting to COVID numbers and latest headlines based on viewer interest. We invite you to submit your questions via Facebook or NU Institute for Global Health or by our email, same name, Global Institute, Global Health Institute at Northwestern.edu, excuse me. I'm going to start with the updated COVID statistics for the United States. We are averaging about 10,305 cases per day 4,073 new hospitalizations per day, roughly 120 COVID deaths per day, and we are staying steady at that 17% new booster proportion. Dr. Murphy, do you have any reactions to those numbers or any global numbers? Yeah, no, this is all going well uh, and as expected, um, but keep in mind, this has not gone away. So it's like the flu. It's, I don't think it's, ever going to go away. Um, but we're down to about flu-like levels. Um, and it's important to keep an eye on this. It's going to be harder now because, uh, you know, the mandatory reporting is over. You know, as of May 11th, uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, uh, declared this is no longer an emergency, and WHO shortly followed with the same thing. So we won't have the same amount of reporting. But we'll still be getting data. We'll be getting mortality data from hospitalized patients and uh, inpatient admissions and stuff like that. Um, and what we're seeing now is this kind of low level of COVID. And that, the reason why it's low level is because there's so much immunity out there. So many people have been vaccinated in the world. You know, 13 billion doses have been given worldwide of every vaccine. Um, the United States is one of the lower vaccinated places, but everybody's gotten COVID. So you get immunity from COVID plus the vaccines plus the new bivalent vaccine. Uh, and what's happening right this second is there's there's always, the world is a big place. So there's, there's outbreaks right now in the Western Pacific uh, area uh, and in Africa, which uh, had been, had a really sort of mild COVID uh, um, pandemic, uh, part of the pandemic. But uh, a lot, there's many reasons for that, but a lot of it is that, uh, uh, I think one of the biggest drivers of that is that the African continent, the median age is so low. You know, it's a younger, much younger population than uh, the rest of the world. But I mean, there's many other reasons as well. But, uh, but anyhow, they're having an uptick in cases right now in the Western Pacific. And we have to keep an eye on where these, uh, these outbreaks uh, are occurring. Absolutely. Of course, the disease is not gone, uh, still very prevalent in many parts of the world. And like you said, very important to keep an eye on. Um, keeping to that topic of the vaccines that you were mentioning, the WHO recently recommended that the new COVID shots, boosters, should only target the XBB variants. Can you tell us why that is and what the difference is between uh, this new booster and what we currently have? Yeah, so the uh, this is referring to the, the, Omic the, we're in the Omicron family of viruses right now. The, the original vaccine was not an Omicron variant. Um, and um, so the, the, any vaccine to the original virus does almost nothing against Omicron. So it's, it's basically a, a waste of protein. <laughs> uh, we don't need it, it's not doing, it's probably doing very little, if anything. So, um, the recommendation now is to just target Omicron variants. And the good news is that uh, this fall, 
uh, all three big companies in the United States, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax, um, are ho hopefully should have uh, not only a uh, not only a bivalent vaccine. It, what, the, the original bivalent will be over. In other words, there'll be no more of that uh, original variant, uh, the the one that was identified in Wuhan, but. It'll be uh, these uh, XBB 15s and 116, uh, and the new ones, uh, uh, XBB 1. Uh, I already mentioned 1.5. So all the new, it, it'll be only the new ones. So it'll be a much more effective um, product, uh, and that should be out in the fall. So if if you're up to date with your vaccinations and you've had one of the bivalent vaccines, you are eligible after four months to take another one. But I, what I'm telling people and what most doctors are telling people, I think, is wait to the fall. Wait till you get this the, the this next version, uh, which will come out about this time that the the flu shot comes out, and get the get the the uh, the updated version this fall because uh, that will have much better coverage um, of the circulating virus uh, right now. Right, and speaking of very effective drugs, uh, it was just announced that Paxlovid was fully approved this month. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, Paxlovid was the, it's the combination, uh, it's two drugs. Uh, it comes in one pill, you take it um, twice a day for um, well, five days. Uh, there, it comes a little pack. It works great. Whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference. If you're at high risk, it cuts the severity of the disease by you know, 80 to 90%. I mean, it's, it's quite effective. Um, some 11 million prescriptions were written for Paxlovid. Um, not sure how many people actually took it because the pharmacists are still giving it away free. The US government is purchasing Paxlovid for about $530 per treatment course. Um, and what this, that's under the emergency use authorization, but there's no more emergency, all right? So they've got full approval now for adults. Uh, for teenagers, for 18 and under, under 18, I guess, um, they still are being, can be treated under the EUA, but this is an approval for adults at high risk. And uh, what this means is that uh, 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 Pfizer, who's the manufacturer, can uh, enhance its marketing. They can, they can market it. And at some particular point, the US government is gonna stop paying and it's gonna fall back into the, uh, the regular pool of drugs, you know, like you get uh, uh, Tamiflu for flu or, or you know, whatever drug, you know, how, how it goes out there in the United States. So, um, that that's uh, that's really what it means. It's full approval. Um, government is still paying right now. Uh, if you're at high risk and you get COVID, if you happen to get COVID, uh, and now there's a variety of tests out there that you can uh, test yourself to get treated. You can get this. The pharmacy, the U.S. government is still paying for it. Uh, definitely take it, even if you've been vaccinated. Uh, so it's a life-saving drug. Wow, oh, that's very important. And it's great to hear that they have full approval after such success and effectiveness with their drug. Well, and um, the Pfizer group is very happy because they sold $18.9 billion of it uh, since they launched it. I mean, it's been uh, quite a blockbuster drug for them. Absolutely. I think $18 billion would quantify a success for them. <laughs> So we reported last week that an estimated 7% uh, prevalence of long COVID existed among Americans who had been infected with COVID-19 previously and how it was a difficult task to quantify or classify long COVID because there were so many different symptoms and variants going around. There was a new study that just came out that was aiming to define the long COVID symptoms. Could you give us any clarity on what they found? Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a um, it, it's a difficult uh, syndromic diagnosis to make. Of course, it's temporally related uh, to having COVID, but um, it we're learning more about it. Let's just uh, put it that way. And uh, the study was in nine thousand seven hundred and sixty-four adults. 
uh, some 8,646 uh, had COVID, showed that 12 symptoms kind of stuck out uh, as to um, being called long COVID, okay? So it include brain fog, very common, um, dizziness, fatigue, gastrointestinal symptoms, heart palpitations, chest pain, chronic cough, abnormal movements, thirst, issues with sexual desire and capacity and loss of taste and smell. And if these last more than 30 days, uh, it can be long COVID and then it goes to 90 days, and uh, six, uh, um, 24 weeks, six months, and then even 12 months. The good news is it does go down. Uh, people do recover from long COVID, mostly. Um, so, um, you know, it it just clarifies uh, these uh, uh, typical symptoms. And uh, what this study also found was that there was less uh, long COVID uh, in the people who've had the Omicron variant. Um, it was much more severe in people infected before 2021, before the variant came out, those who are unvaccinated and those that got reinfected, it was, uh, it was uh, um, uh, less severe in the one, later on in the game here. So um, yeah, and the other important thing from this study, it showed that uh, even if somebody had mild COVID, they could still have long COVID. So it's not like they had a really bad case and that led to long COVID. So even a mild COVID can lead to these kind of symptoms. And you know it's still at about 7% prevalence. So this is, uh, this is concerning. Hopefully that will go down. These newer variants don't seem to be as much associated with it. And maybe all the immunity built up uh, uh, in the population will dampen it, but it does exist. It still exists and it's a risk. Absolutely. And it's a, an area for more research, absolutely, because yeah. like you said, there's just so much we don't know still. Um, and if you don't have particularly uh, harsh symptoms, you could still end up with long COVID. So there's a lot of mystery involved there. Moving on to some of our more general infectious disease headlines. First, starting with this upcoming month of June is Pride Month. We talked previously about some problems with MPOX resurging, um, do you think there's a possibility that with the warm weather and a lot of uh, events coming up, there could be a resurgence of MPOX? Well, remember MPOX, uh, formerly known as monkeypox, um, has been around for a long time. It's been in rural Africa associated with animals and, and an occasional transmission uh, to a human. And then, but that was the trend, that was the transmission it was animal to man. They got the MPOX. There was very little uh, transmission human to human. Uh, that was the original thing. It was quite lethal though, 10, 10 plus percent mortality. So, you know, somehow it, it, it got in to a, uh, a human from the United Kingdom who uh, went home. Uh, and that transmitted between people. Uh, it got into the MSN community, um, men who have sex with men. And it was just before Pride Month a year ago. And so um, then it just, it got into that, that group and it just, it spread around the world in literally in 30 days. Uh, and uh, it was just amazing, you know. Um, the mortality rate was much lower than the original type of MPOX that was seen. Uh, it was, you know, one percent or less, and it was usually, you know, a risk factor associated with the death. Um, the one of the more common things was uh, people who had HIV uh, were more at more at risk for severe disease and death. Uh, people did die from it. Um, but anyhow, there was a, um, so the cases, uh, it was an emergency for a while, and then an emergency was stopped because the cases went down so much, uh, because a, a relatively small shift in behavior uh, actually can, can reduce it, plus there was a treatment, plus there was two vaccines out there, and the vaccine were picked up uh, when there was like this little peak of MPOX. However, at the end of the day, the people at risk, only 23% are fully vaccinated. 
And with MPOX, um, the effectiveness of the vaccine with one dose is only 36%. And with two doses, it's 75%. That's a huge difference. So people that are at risk uh, for MPOX uh, really need to get both of those doses. If you had the one vaccine last year, just get the second dose now, that's okay. Uh, they've also shown that people who've had the smallpox vaccine as a kid, like me, uh, would not be, at, you get some protection from the old smallpox vaccine because it's very much related to smallpox. So uh, there was a little um, outbreak uh, cluster of cases here in Chicago. It was, uh, you know, we're having like one to three cases per day in the city. We were, we were seeing it even at Northwestern. And, uh, you know, a lot of those people were vaccinated, but most of them only had one shot. Uh, so it's got to be looked at closely. So, you know, we're encouraging people uh, to have both shots. Uh, some of the people that had it, though, did have both. But remember, it's not 100% effective, 75%. But that 75 is a lot better than 36. So uh, get vaccinated, uh, and uh, hopefully people will be a little bit more careful during Pride Month, which is Absolutely. June. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another story that came out of the US this week, there was an outbreak of suspected fungal meningitis in Texas. It was a relatively small number of cases, but what can you tell us about uh, that fungal meningitis outbreak and you know any precedent that we might have in the country? Well, this is uh, very, um, um, very concerning uh, issue. Um, these cases were tied to surgery centers in Matamoros, Mexico. Um, there's a lot of Americans go to Mexico to have medical procedures. Um, and, you know, the doctors, many of them are U.S. trained. They're very, you know, uh, nice looking facilities. So they have all the equipment. You know, the doctors are well trained and, and they do it for a fraction of the price here. Um, you know, I had a, a patient of mine who was living outside of uh, Guadalajara and they needed a, a procedure and the doctor had trained at the, the University of Texas uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Houston and um, very well trained guy. And he said, hey, look, I can do this surgery here. I do it. Uh, I was working in Texas. I came back home uh, and the cost there was less than the copay in the United States. So it's, it's pretty popular uh, to have procedures done at places in Mexico. Mexico has a, has a pretty has universal health coverage and has a pretty good medical care. Their metrics are, are really pretty good. Um, so anyway, uh, but they're having this outbreak of uh, fungal, what's, it's a su suspected fungal meningitis from these surgery centers in Matamoros and uh, two people have died and uh, three remain hospitalized. And it's, it's very uh, concerning because uh, there have at these, wherever this is coming from, um, over 200 people uh, have uh, received their, some medical procedure there. Uh, so if anybody had, uh, typically it's from an epidural anesthesia uh, at any of these uh, two uh, identified Mexican clinics, uh, you know, if they get sick, you know, they need to um, go to a hospital immediately, a good hospital, because uh, this is a potentially lethal disease. Um, people may remember that in 2012, a very similar occurrence happened here in the United States that was really quite severe. It came from um, a, uh, the uh, <clears throat> same kind of thing. It was uh, from surgery. It was fungal meningitis uh, with a fungus called Aspergillus fumigatus, and uh, it was from contaminated um, uh, medication given in the uh, anesthesia, and <clears throat> uh, it ended up with 64 people dying and 700 people uh, getting sick, uh, and this was just a strictly a contamination issue, which is probably the same thing which is happening down in Matamoros, although we don't know what fungus it is yet. Uh, but in the U.S. Uh, outbreak in 2012, uh, two pharmacists actually that were responsible for that actually went to jail. Uh, and, um, you know, so it, uh, it can be very serious. You got to be very careful 
uh, when you're mixing these medications and injecting it right into the, the epidural, epidural, you know, so um, it can be very serious. So anyone who's uh, mostly uh, at this uh, uh, clinic in Metamoros is mostly residents from the number one is residents from Texas. Um, but, uh, you know, anybody could have gone down there. So um, if anyone has gone down or you know somebody, they, they really need to be on the lookout for any kind of symptom, headache, stiff neck, unexplained fever, whatever, they need to really get into a, a hospital and get evaluated thoroughly, quickly. Absolutely. That's a very scary situation and one that we absolutely hope does not grow to be even larger. Um, Recently, the FDA advisors, they did not approve, but they backed an RSV vaccine for pregnant women that protects their newborns. Can you tell us a little bit about that vaccine and why it's so important? Well, probably before a year ago, nobody ever even, other than people in a hospital, you know, didn't, nobody heard of RSV virus, respiratory syncytial virus. But now there's a vaccine for it. They are making medication for it. Uh, it's a, uh, can be a deadly disease in very young children in particular, like under six months, and in older people or immunocompromised people, people who've had a, a, an organ transplant. Um, it can be really very bad uh, disease. And, um, so a vaccine was developed and uh, this is, uh, it's developed. So um, now, so the pregnant women aren't really so much at risk for respiratory syncytial virus. I mean, they can get it, but it's pretty rare. Uh, however, they will make the antibody, the antibody will transfer to the, the fetus and then the infant has antibody, has, has the mother's antibody, which will last through the period of highest risk for infants to get sick from RSV. So uh, Pfizer did a study with 7,400 pregnant women and found it was 82% at preventing severe respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, during the baby's most vulnerable, vulnerable three, first three months of life. And even at six months, it was 69% uh, protective against severe illness. So um, there was no signs of uh, safety uh, problems and the advisors unanimously voted that the shot was effective they voted 10 to four that the safety data was adequate. Um, and, um, uh, and so it's uh, got approved. So it's just another way we can, we can lower um, childhood mortality even more now uh, if a pregnant woman gets this. So uh, it's really a very exciting um, uh, finding because in, in kids under five, you know, every year between 100 and 300 die from this, and um, many uh, many get sick from it, and I mean you can, they can be very ill, and there's no real treatment right at this particular point. So um, it's it's just another way to lower the risk of a very serious disease in children. Absolutely, and particularly in the most vulnerable children, right. those who are newborns. Right. There was more news from the WHO this week that they are launching a global infectious disease surveillance network. What can you tell us about this new network and what their goals are? Well, the U.S. is kind of doing the same. They, they had kind of a, a loose network anyway. Obviously, it wasn't uh, big enough, but I mean, there's efforts all over the place doing it. But globally, the WHO is really pushing for this. And uh, they have launched the Global Infectious Disease Surveillance Network um, last Saturday, actually. Um, and it's basically just a big surveillance project around the world with uh, stations around the world looking at the various pathogens uh, that are coming through and uh, analyzing them and trying to identify diseases early. And when something pops up someplace, they actually know what it is, uh, can diagnose it, and then the other centers can keep their eye out, you know, focus more on, on that particular one. So, uh, you know, uh, between SARS, uh, you know, in the early 2000s and COVID uh, in the last couple of years, I mean, it shows how important these networks uh, really can be. So this is just a, a great thing. This, this uh, uh, you know, will be funded internationally. And, uh, you know, prevention is always, always much cheaper 
than putting out a fire. Um, you know, prevent the fire rather than you know put out the fire and have everything burned down. So it's a it's a it's a nice uh, safety net that's uh, going out there. So this uh, in the U.S. Uh, is doing a kind of a comparable thing, or hopefully we'll cooperate with them. Absolutely, and it's great to know that you know the world is putting these uh, structures into place to try to help us navigate into the future and avoid more global epidemics, pandemics, like we have just gone through. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, um, even though the WHO is doing this, like, let's just take Africa for an example. 65% um, of all the research done in Africa is funded by a United States entity, uh, the NIH, CDC, Department of Defense, USAID, um, uh, big foundations like the Gates Foundation. So we've we've uh, built up a lot of the infrastructure in many places around the world that allows these other places in these low and middle income countries to actually participate uh, in this surveillance network. So it's you know we're all in this together, and uh, you know I think this is a really uh, great idea, and I think it's very important. Absolutely, I'm glad we could add, uh, end on that uh, happy note there with the. Uh working together, all of us throughout the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for answering questions, reacting to headlines. We very much appreciate your expertise. Well, thank you, Katie. Have a great and thank weekend. thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for viewing and watching. We invite you to submit your questions below on YouTube, via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health, or by email at globalhealthinstitute at Northwestern EDU. Thank you again.